This video is brought to you by Aralik, makers of the Altair G1 digital streaming deck. Click to aralik.com for more information. We've started today with wine. If wine is not your thing, then maybe this is. This is a picture disc LP from Plaid. This is a collection of 10 remixes from the sort of second half of their career. If my dad were here, he'd be asking, who the bloody hell are Plaid? Um, Plaid is a duo who used to be part of the Black Dog, actually, but that was years ago. And they make electronic music. They're from the UK, although one of them lives in LA, I believe. And I think there's a really good way to explain exactly what this kind of music sounds like. It is electronic music, but to borrow a phrase from Tom Waits, to me, plaid sound like electric sugar. This compilation was put together by Touched Music, who make compilations and sell them for charity, so all proceeds go to charity. That's why I'm showing this off today. Um, you can get this from Touched Music's Bandcamp. There's a double CD with even more remixes, I think 28. And if, you know, if that's not your thing and you want to download, that's also available to you. But again, proceeds go to charity. Now, obviously, Plaid are not the subject of this video, although we will be coming back to them at some point. Today, I want to talk about a company from Denmark. They are, the name of the company is spelled G-A-T-O. So whether it's Gato or Gato, I don't know, you decide. Now, this company, they're not huge. There are five people that work for Gato, um, plus a couple of freelancers. And they make amplifiers and speakers. We're gonna be looking at an amplifier today. They make everything pretty much on site. So we're gonna be talking about an amplifier called the Amp 150. It is made in Denmark, not in Asia. I think this was Gato's very first product and it's been running ever since in their lineup. Since 2008, I think they were formed. Formed, it's like a band, isn't it? Um, but I think the first product didn't spill till 2010, which was the Amp 150. And I first met the guys from Gato at Munich High End in 2018, like two years ago. And I was expressing an interest in reviewing one of their products back then, and they said to me, John, we want you to do that, but we need you to hang on. And the reason is, is we are shifting our sales model from a dealer distributor model to direct sell. So in the last year and a half, they've essentially fired all their distributors um, and are selling direct from their website, I believe, or from certain dealers around the world. Now this has had a fairly dramatic influence on the pricing of their gear because there's no distributor involved in the chain anymore. So the Amp 150 used to sell for 7,000 euros when it was through the distributor dealer model. And now for the direct sale model, it sells for 4,000 euros. That's a 40% drop. Oh, I've just pulled a face because he realizes that's, you know, 40% is a significant drop. Now we need to talk about what the hell the Amp 150 is. So it's an integrated, it has no built-in phono stage. It has no built-in DAC or streamer. It's just an integrated amplifier. And the way the 150 looks, I think, will divide a room. I mean, for me, the looks are what drew me closer to it. And I've since learned from Gato that actually the whole design aesthetic 
is inspired by an American class of World War II submarines. Yeah, I know British people are always talking about the war. There are vents on the side inspired by the submarine. The wooden panel on the top is meant to sort of echo the submarine's decking. And the sort of, yeah, the curved nature is meant to be very much like a, you know, a waterborne vessel. And the dial on the front, the middle dial, is also meant to look like a submarine dial from, you know, yeah, from the 40s. And it has an arm that moves as you turn the volume up and down. That's not, you know, you can see it from the listening position, which is better than the little kind of red LED readout, which you can only really see close up. But I believe that Gato used that arm in, in many different ways across their product range. So it, its design language comes from, yeah, a submarine, which is kind of wacky, but I love, I love this kind of stuff because it makes for an interesting story. And stories are what draw people to certain products. Now, normally at this point, I'd open the amp up, but I did try it and I can't do it. And I did phone Gato and ask them like, how do I open this thing up? And they're like, you can't because, because this isn't one of our first, well, our first products. You actually need to take the faceplate off to get inside. I was like, no, no, I'm not doing that. So I'm gonna have to explain this to you in that, like every manufacturer has their thing, right? Now Gato's thing is that yes, it's a class AB amplifier. Yes, it has transistors on the output stage, but they're not a matched pair of positive and negative because according to Gato, those positive and negative transistors have slightly different properties and, and values. So what Gato have done is instead of taking a positive and a negative, that's for like the upper half of the sine wave and then for the lower half of the sine wave, what they've done is they've taken two negatives, two negative transistors that have identical measured values. And then what they do is they invert one of them to make it behave as like the upper half of the, the sine wave. Now they do that in the middle of the amplifier between the input and the output. As the signal comes into the amplifier, it's buffered and then volume attenuation is applied by an integrated circuit, a chip. Now that's done in the analog domain. The volume control operates in the digital domain, rather, sorry, the volume rotary operates in the digital domain, and it sends digital markers to that integrated circuit to tell it which volume setting to apply. So it's a digitally controlled analog volume control that's done just on the other side of the input buffer. And Gato told me they've done this because it's better for channel matching at lower volumes. So having a microprocessor behind the volume knob that then sends a signal to an analog volume control circuit is for them the better way to keep left and right balanced as you turn the volume down. And apparently that they've also designed the volume knob to be just a joy to use. And it really is. It feels like heavy, reassuring. It's nice to turn. It's chunky. So if you're a fan of like chunky volume knobs, this could be an amp for you. And then the source input control knob obviously moves you through the source input. So you've got source input on the left, volume on the right. These are big, heavy, solid feeling control knobs. They're sort of infinite rotaries. They go round and round and round forever. So yeah, it's just, if I do this, it kind of feels a bit weird. <laughs> It's like, happy Mondays, isn't it? You're twisting my melons, man. Yeah, so yeah, we should talk about music. I've just mentioned the happy Mondays. I don't listen to the happy Mondays ever. But yeah, let's talk about music I've been listening to through this amp for the last, what, two months? Yeah. So as, as well as listening to Plaid's Stem Cell compilation, I've also been playing a lot of Thomas Fellman recently. Thomas Fellman, for me, is the sort of like the living heartbeat of the orb, or was. Um, this is one of his solo records. This is Los Legos. I think this was a 2017 record. It's like electronic music that has a, it always has a, his stuff always has a swing to it, you know, like a, yeah, a groove. 
which is not common in electronic music because normally you think it's like doof, doof, doof. And Thomas Feldman stuff is not like that. And that's what I think makes it really interesting. And there's lots of other interesting sounds in here. Okay, so that. Um, in a similar vein, an absolute stone cold classic from the Future Sound of London, Life Forms. I think most people of my vintage know this. Ambient techno psychedelia, maybe. Very, very good record. Completely different, there's a CD actually, something from The Rakes. These are a post-punk band that were big in about 2007 slash 8. They sound a bit like, I guess, Wire, maybe. I think they only made three records and they just disbanded. But this is the first one, Capture Release, it's called. Absolutely superb. Going back to the 80s, for some reason I have two copies of this Thomas Dolby's The Flat Earth. It's not the most amazing recording. It's a bit thin at times, even on vinyl, but what a great album. But talking of great albums, I have discovered something this last week or so that I think is probably the best album I've heard in years. And it's from a band called Dry Cleaning. They're from London, and the single is Scratch Card Lanyard. But to me, it's like indie rock, post-punk. It sounds exactly like the cross between the Blue Aeroplanes and Black Box Recorder. I'll leave it at that, but I just think it is the most thrilling, interesting record that I've heard in years. Like the lyrics are just spot on because they're, they're odd. They go off in different directions. They're like non-tangential. And I love that. So yeah, this is the music I've been listening to to sort of assess the Amp 150 from Gato. So this is a highly resolving amplifier, and that's largely helped by a lot of treble information, actually like the very upper treble. So where room ambience lives, where the sense of space in music lives, it's very, very good for that. Um, it, this amplifier also has a very strong sense of like pace you know, like in terms of the power supply keeping up with the dynamic shifts of the music. And in many ways, we could say that, you know, this amplifier sounds a lot like plaid, like electric sugar. But of course, we can't just stop there. We have to qualify this by grounding our findings, my findings, in a comparison. Now for that comparison, I needed another amplifier that sold for a similar price that has a balanced input, because this has a balanced input, that has two knobs either side of a display. And that was an easy one for me actually. I just pulled out the Hegel H390 and used that as my sort of AB comparator for this review. So like the Amp 150, the Hegel H390 is a highly resolving amplifier. It's very powerful. It's more powerful than the Gato. I think it gives us about 270 watts per channel as opposed to the Gato's 150, hence the name. Um, it operates in this high-end territory of Class AB amplifiers. They're both Class AB, although they both have their sort of different thing. Obviously, Hegel have their Sound Engine 2 feed-forward correction. That's kind of their thing. The pair of negative transistors is Gato's thing, if you like, their, their hook. And both of these amps have more than enough power to satisfy the Wilson Audio Tune Tots behind me. And I could live with either. Here's the thing though, they don't sound the same, they don't look the same, they don't have the same feature set, and then they don't feel the same in use. Let's tackle the Hegel first. Like why would you buy a Hegel H390 compared to the Gato? Well, you'd buy one if you wanted more power, you know, 200 and something watts per channel. You would also buy the Hegel if you want 
a streamer and a DAC built into your integrated amp because the Gato doesn't give you that, but the Hegel does. In terms of sound quality, the Hegel has a plumper bottom end, but it's not as airy up top as the Gato. It's a little bit more humid. It sort of sounds like it's music is cutting through thicker air, but it is richer because of that plumper bottom end and that sort of more, I don't want to say hooded because it's not hooded, but it, it's not as open and as vibrant as the Gato. That's not to say it's not as good, it really is. And I think the Hegel's qualities, for me, make it the better match to some of the sort of angular, punk, post-punk, new wave that I tend to favour. It just keeps that top end from just going a little bit too far into sort of that lemon squeeze in the eye territory. You know, when you kind of like, you're almost about to wince, but you don't quite. And I never get near that with the Hegel. So I know that I'm very safe in playing things like the rakes and dry cleaning, and I'm never gonna get near that kind of moment. Whereas with the Gato, we do have to be a little bit more careful. I'll talk about matching electronics and things like that in a moment. But the Gato has a more open top end. It has a slightly keener upper mid-range lower treble. I would also say that the Gato's top end is a bit sweeter than the Hegel's. And it, it does seem to have, I think because of that keener lower treble upper mid-range, it does seem to have a better sense of yeah, pace and rhythm and timing. That's a name thing, isn't it? But you know, like a better sense of like music's momentum than the Hegel. So it, it sort of has more pop, certainly with voices and things like that. That's an illusion of pop anyway, you know, the way I hear it. And its sense of inner space in a recording is probably more crisply and cleanly communicated than via the Hegel. And for me, that makes it better suited to things like the Future Sound of London, Plaid, Thomas Fehlman. You know, when it comes to Thomas Dolby, right, these sort of 80s recordings, I still think the Hegel is just one of those <laughs> wonderful designs that really brings out the best in those recordings. Whereas I think in this case, the Gato 150 lays things a little bit more bare. So we can hear that this was not necessarily, you know, a great recording. It's like in the 80s, it almost like, <laughs> some of these mastering engineers forgot to put the bass in. And yeah, I think the Flat Earth has been remastered, but I don't recall whether it's any good or not. I still go back to the original anyway. That's the one I play. So that's the one I have to find gear that makes it sound the best for me, right? Like this is the whole point of Hi-Fi. It's like making the music you like sound the best for you. So those are the, the sound qualitative differences that I hear. If I wanted to kind of bring out an analogy, I would say that the Hegel is like a fuller bodied, richer Rioja. So like a full bodied red wine. And the Gato is a bit more like a Pinot Noir. It's younger and fruitier, so, but not young and fruity, just a little bit a little bit different. And that's kind of the point as well here is that even though I've magnified the sound qualitative differences, as I said in the last video, that's my job to do so. But really the sound quality differences between these two amps are definitely not night and day. The Gato does not blow the Hegel out of the water or vice versa. Um, no one's getting destroyed. You know, they're just small differences. And I mentioned this because I think the bigger differences between these two amps lie in price, because the Hegel is a grand more expensive than 
the Gato. They lie in functionality because the Hegel comes with a streaming DAC and the Gato doesn't. And they lie especially in looks because the Gato is a funky looking piece. It's not going to be to everybody's taste. The Hegel is a more conservative looking piece. So we need to keep those factors in play when we are talking about sound quality differences because they don't sort of exist independently of one another when we're making a decision about which amp to buy for our loud speakers. One advantage, one strong advantage the Gato has for some people is that it allows us to choose our DAC and streamer. So with the thousand dollar difference, we can option an RME ADI 2FS DAC with a Raspberry Pi USB feed going in. It's about a thousand euros. So we can you know, get that, which is a great DAC, and also has headphone output. So we get sort of more varied functionality from the Gato system as I've got behind me here with the RME and the Pi. And I also think that the Gato is probably best matched to DACs that you know, are either, oh God, I hate this word, neutral. We can't know if they're neutral, but they have that kind of feeling of neutral or slightly warmer. So the Cambridge CXNV2 streamer, I think is an excellent dance partner for the Gato. Um, I wouldn't put a Chord Electronics Hugo 2 or Mojo on it. I think that would overemphasize that sort of uber detailed nature and maybe sound, uh, make the Gato sound a little bit thin. So we have to be a little bit careful there. And equally with the Hegel, because it's kind of a sort of a, a richer tasting wine, we can put a Chord DAC with that, but we probably wouldn't put the Cambridge with it. In terms of turntables, like with the Gato, I much prefer the Technics with the Autophon. When I'm talking about turntables and I talk about the Technics, I'm actually referring to the Technics with the Autophon cartridge installed, which is why I say the Technics with the Autophon. I think some of you missed that in my last video. It's the whole package. So I prefer that Technics, that Autophon with the Gato. With the Hegel, I prefer the Rager Planar 2 with the Zoo Audio Denon DL103R. That turntable is a turntable with the Zoo cartridge. It is a complete package. Anyway, so those are some matching hardware considerations that we need to factor in to this comparison, which brings us to look and feel. The Hegel. It's a monstrous amp, it's heavy. It's also more pedestrian in its appearance. So I think that makes it more of a put it in your hi-fi rack kind of amplifier. You know, it does its job, but it doesn't need to be shown off. Whereas I think the Gato is the exact opposite of that. I mean, I've got it on my commode here behind me. It's an amp you're gonna to wanna to show off because it looks unusual, it looks funky. I think it looks really cool actually. Both of them, both the Hegel, I've got it over here, the Hegel and the, the Gato have these sort of twin controls that do the same thing, source on the left, volume on the right. They both have the same sort of weight to them. The Hegel has, you can feel like notches as you turn it. The, the Gato is completely smooth, but the volume control knob is sort of deeper like this. So you really feel like you're, like, ergonomically engaging with something, ergonomically engaging with something. You know, it just, it feels really nice to use, very satisfying. This is a very underrated quality that doesn't get spoken about enough when it comes to amplifiers. How nice is it to turn the volume? Simple as that. I'm gonna be talking about that more often, I think, moving forwards. <laughs> Thank you.
So it's 2.30ish p.m. right now. It's a bit early for a glass of red for me anyway. But later on, you know, I'll be sampling the Rioja and the Pinot Noir and I've had them before, so I know that I like the Pinot Noir for this, I like the Rioja for this, for these qualities. And I like the Hegel for its, for me, kinder, gentler handling of less than stellar recorded punk, post-punk, indie rock. And I like the Gato for the excitement and the, the detail excavation it applies to ambient techno and techno. In my last video about turntables, it was pretty apparent which turntable I preferred to use. For me, there was a clear, oh God, I hate to use the word winner, but I guess winner for me. Um, in this particular situation, if you're picking up the vibe that John can't decide which one he likes the most, you'd be absolutely right. I can't, I just, I cannot split these two and, and say this one is my preference, which I guess, is a, is a win for, well, it's, yeah, it's a win for Gato because it, they come in at a thousand euros cheaper with their amp than the Hegel. Let's not forget that the Hegel amplifiers sell through a dealer distributor network and are made in Asia, whereas the, the Gato is made in Denmark and is sold direct, so it has a, you know, the price advantage of not having a distributor network. And I think, you know, when you put the RME with it, you've got a great combination. But again, I can't tell you that that is better than the, the Hegel over here. Just can't do it. So, you know, there's not like a, yeah, no one's getting eaten alive. This eats that alive. No, <laughs> never the case, never the case. I mean, unless we're talking like mega differences between like loudspeakers, but with amplifiers, you know, the differences are small. And as I've said before in the last video and in this one, it's my job to magnify them which I find, you know, really interesting. I like doing this. I love, you know, putting this and this, you know, on a bench and kind of go, trying to find out, you know, how do they differ sonically? How do they differ in terms of feature set, in terms of looks, in terms of the way they feel? All of these things are factors in our buying, purchasing decisions. So I think all of this speaks to Gato's achievement here in that they've made an integrated amp that competes on the same level as one of the better sounding pieces at its price point, but with a slightly different accent on which kind of music it favors to that rival. But most of all, they've done so and they've made a really awesome looking amplifier that's not just a black box that performs a task, it also looks fantastic and I think is a, a real sort of showpiece for anybody's lounge slash listening room, just like mine. I love this, the way this thing looks and sounds. I think it's terrific. So when it comes to the, like, the pointy end of a decision, looks matter. If you like this video, please smash the like button down here. If you like my attitude towards high-end audio, these are two high-end amplifiers that sound slightly different but look way different. If you like that my attitude factors in look and feel, then please subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.